Hi everyone, and welcome to my PlayStation 3 emulation talk for FOSDEM 2022. I hope you guys are enjoying the rest of the tracks at the emulation development dev room and the rest of the conference as well. So today we're going to talk about the PlayStation 3 software and hardware stack and how emulators, most notably RPCS3, have managed to achieve what once was considered impossible. So first, a little bit about myself. I've been working as a cybersecurity engineer slash consultant for several years and particularly interested in low-level development and reverse engineering, which over time has led me to work in some interesting emulators, uh, which in my view represent the best of both worlds. Uh, you get to tear things apart and you get to re-implement them. Among those free and open source emulators, I've been a developer for RPCS3 uh, and the creator of Nucleus, both PlayStation 3 emulators. And in recent years, I've started Orbital, which is a low-level virtualization-based PlayStation 4 emulator. So, uh, why am I talking about PlayStation 3 today? It is now over a decade since the most prominent PS3 emulator, RPCS3, began its journey. What started with a botched triangle and quite a unique versioning convention has, 10 years later, resulted in a user-friendly and performant emulator that has achieved what was deemed impossible only a few years ago, smoothly running two-thirds of the catalog, in addition to modding, upscaling, multiplayer support, and other valuable features. And of course, still faithful to its roots, keeping intractable version numbers and now emulating high definition, colorful triangles. Um, but jokes aside, uh, none of this will be possible without the efforts of the current maintainers, Nico and KD11, and the many developers, project administrators, contributors, supporters that have kept RPCS3 alive. Long time ago, RPCS3 somewhat de facto replaced my higher education, where intense eight hour weeks taught me more than any university curricula ever could. However, today I'm no longer involved with the project or the scene. Nonetheless, I'm thankful to the team for this opportunity to relearn and transmit knowledge. Um, what is on the agenda today includes a tour through the PS3 hardware, particularly CPU and GPU, the software that runs on it, and how emulators have re-implemented these components. Focus will be RPCS3, even though its approach, implementation, tooling, testing can be shared with other projects. So, what is my goal behind that? Um, First, uh, domestifying the console, uh, especially for emulator developers. Complexity doesn't necessarily scale with the number of transistors or firmware size, as layers of abstraction can be quite thin. Um, so for people should try to dive into hardware more often, I think. Um, second is mapping seemingly mysterious concepts such as SPU channels or R6 contexts into things that you know. Um, along the way, we'll find brilliant yet unnoticed gems and tricks. And lastly, inviting people to embrace all other so-called impossible projects out there. Just a disclaimer, uh, there is a lot to unpack in little time and hard to do so pleasing everyone, so please bear with me. So let's start with hardware. In this section we will cover the Cell Broadband Engine CPU and the NVIDIA Reality Synthesizer GPU. Let's begin with Cell, the most ambitious and recognizable part of the PS3. It was designed as an heterogeneous CPU in which two different architectures coexist in the form of a leader PPE core and assistant SPE cores, interconnected through quite an innovative bus, which aimed to alleviate congestion, prioritizing bandwidth over latency. This was designed by the so-called STI Alliance over a long and expensive process, and to this day remains as arguably the most ambitious console hardware project. All patent revealed uh, impressive theoretical performance figures, which opened the door to supercomputing and scientific research projects with cell clusters, and even the possibility of real-time software ray tracing. And fortunately, as a result, the internals of this CPU became public knowledge. In the PS3, cell is clocked at 3.2 GHz and half that 1.6 for buses. It consisted of 1 PPE and 8 SPEs, of which only 6 are accessible by end users. Additionally, it contains 3 interfaces to external hardware. MIC for memory, exposing a dual channel to humble 256 MB of RAM bus XDR RAM, PEI for peripherals and other cells with two asymmetric flex IO interfaces, a fast one for RSX, and a slow one for the south bridge, which is called a super companion chip. Test for Syscon, which exposes UART, SPI, and debugging functionality. These nine cores and three interfaces connect through the AIB, in which adjacent pairs of the 12 nodes share four buses or channels, two per direction. Though fascinating, we'll leave it out of scope and focus on the CPU cores. The power processing element description you usually find is that of a big Endian 64-bit PowerPC core with a total of 32 kilobytes for each L1 instruction in the data caches, 512 kilobytes of L2 cache managed by the power processor storage subsystem, 
Um, the L1 register files and execution units are the PPU, the power processing unit. But you will see the terms PPE and PPU used interchangeably. Um, although caches and SMT are less relevant for AMU devs, um, IEEE compliance will surely feel reassuring after the messy floating point in PS2. Just as a quick refresher, PowerPC is a RISC architecture with a generous amount of integer, floating point, and 128-bit vector registers, when Altibec extensions are enabled, of course. Each set comes with a register to handle exception status and sometimes control operations, namely XR, FPSCR, VSCR to track carry overflows, NANDs, iterations, and so on, um, as well as dedicated registers for conditions, an instruction pointer, return addresses, and counters, respectively. Uh, and for anyone scared of writing x86 assembler, it has a line for byte instructions with a nice and simple encoding, so yay. <laughs> this architecture was also used in other consoles of the generation, Xbox 360 and the Wii, albeit 32-bit. Sony did minor modifications to the standard PowerPC ABI to support 32-bit effective addresses, um, that is like the same as virtual addresses, and this uh, makes sense given the little RAM. And in the other hand, we have the synergistic processing elements, which feature another risk begandian architecture heavily influenced by IBM and PowerPC. It offers 256 kilobytes of local storage, which acts effectively as an addressable low latency L1 cache for both data and instructions. And besides some PowerPC inspired and some unknown or numbered special purpose registers, all the computations on the SPUs happen on a massive set of 128-bit uh, CMD general purpose registers. 128 of them. Uh, for comparison, that's equivalent of the ZMM register space in Intel's AVX512. Um, like the PPU, it is clocked at 3.2 GHz, and each SPU instruction is mapped to two pipelines which different with different execution units, allowing it to dispatch up to two instructions per cycle. But then again, instructions have at least two cycle latency, so yeah. <laughs> uh, the fix uh, point or integer unit is asymmetrically spread across both pipelines, allowing CMD operations on up to 32-bit components of the vector registers, except for multiplications, which only support 16-bit operands, uh, likely because handling potential 64-bit results on 32-bit operands would have required heavy modifications to the FXU. And then there's the FPU in the even pipeline with both single and double precision support. Although the former's IEEE compliance is limited and behavior around NANDs, infinites, is, is, it's not breaking as it can be worked around with reasonable overhead. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not good. Uh, double precision supports most of the spec, allowing for simple one-to-one -one mapping into host machines. And that's it, the SPU ISA is mostly ALU and node stores, uh, not mentioned in the slides, conditional holds and interrupts and, and the hilarious branch hints and whatnot, but all of that is of little relevance. Um, one thing that is relevant is the MFC between the SPU and the rest of the chip. This sets it apart for most CPUs as it provides explicit control over data and interrupt transactions within and outside the SPE. It consists of a DMA engine, with two command queues populated by, respectively, the SPU itself and proxy devices, which are just the PPE or peripherals. These commands allow initiating read-writes with uh, get or put commands, synchronization via barriers or fences, and atomic operations on memory. Transfers are sent individually or in lists and operate on up to 16 kilobyte blocks. For security reasons, of course, there is a MMU configurable over MMIO registers, uh, think of it as a PPE-controlled IOMMU, it's the same. Uh, the system will maintain an identical mapping of the PPE effective addresses, which simplifies things a lot for user and emulators, like our CS3. And lastly, the synergistic bus interface, which is just the middleman between the EIB and the MFC protocols. Uh, lastly, the SPE provides mailboxes for communication syn or synchronization with each other, uh, interfacing with the mailboxes or the aforementioned MFC from within the SPU involves reading and writing to so-called SPU channels. Uh, this happens over a pair of instructions, which you can treat as the in and out pair of x86 I.O. ports. The only difference is that some of the channels might block. And for that matter, an additional read channel count instruction was introduced, which is set to 1 for non-blocking channels and zero when blocking ones will block, that is when they are empty for reads or full for writes, uh, otherwise they return on zero, I guess. Um, but this begs the question, okay, 
what were the SPEs able to do with all of this? Uh, well, apparently quite a lot. Uh, the original ambition behind the cell brought an engine led them to pursue real-time software rendering, leading them to impressive demos and showcases as the one you're watching right now. Um, legends and unverified hearsay hint that the cell was originally meant to be an APU-like chip for the PlayStation 3, um, but that was apparently not enough. Uh, there is speculation about what prompted the last-minute introduction of a dedicated GPU mostly centered around latency and potential complexity issues of working with SPEs. Uh, whatever the reason, in 2005, Sony and NVIDIA introduced the Reality Synthesizer RSX, um, reportedly based on the NVIDIA 17, uh, 7800 GDX graphics card. Uh, this is what we're gonna cover now. According to public material, it is a Curie family GPU with a slightly modified G70, G71 architecture, um, also called uh, NV47, although the car itself reports as NV4D uh, as strange. But anyway, if you're not familiar with NVIDIA GPU jargon, just think of it as Dark 3D9 generation GPU. Uh, the clock speeds from the original announcement and the documentation were downgraded shortly after. Uh, in the GPU core, only vector vertex shaders were allegedly affected, which is strange, but it already hints at the non-unified shader architecture we'll see later. Um, this scripting of the hardware led to mismatching theoretical figures and benchmarks of the hardware. Although bandwidth figures seem like a little bit irrelevant for emulator developers, they influence how game developers use the hardware. And consequently, it influences what emulators will spend most time doing, and that's what they need to optimize. Um, on the right, you will see the links and most significant theoretical bandwidth bottlenecks that the RSX goes through in order to access both RAM and NVIDIA RAM, which are known as main and local memory, respectively. Um, however, below, you can see the actual access speeds to each region when natively accessed from a user and application. Just pay special attention to the cell accesses to GDDR3. Um, with Ingenuity, some studios achieved SPU post-processing effects, but Many understandably did graphics exclusively on the RSX, so underutilizing the SPUs. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, anyway, enough of memory. Um, let's focus on the GPU core. Uh, the RSX is made of several engines seen in other NVIDIA GPUs. Some of them even persist across architectures and generations, although becoming quite unrecognizable. PGREF and P5 are most relevant from a user land perspective as they handle 2D and 3D graphics and command submission respectively. Um, but many others such as like bass, memory and display controllers are equally important and accordingly configured by system drivers. External interfaces are PPCI and PPCI for audio, both adapted to the Flex.io interface, PRANDAP for display output, and PFB for local and main memory, indirectly. <clears throat> and these engines and their MMIO register ranges have been extensively documented by the Nuvo and VTools project, uh, among others by uh, Marcelina Kolchelsnitska, um, aka MWK. And for anyone who might be familiar with AMD GPUs instead, I've written down their uh, somewhat equivalent engine counterparts, if it helps, um, but take them with a grain of salt. Um, these engines can be configured over MMIO after remapping a single massive 32 megabyte um, base address register over IOIF. Um, as we will see later, the PlayStation 3 software in turn allows mapping of some of these devices back into user land, uh, for instance, to quickly submit commands by modifying P5O um, read write pointers in the ring buffer with pretty much zero overhead. Um, however, the low granularity of virtual pages, um, both in four kilobyte user, like they are both four kilobyte user land and kernel, allows accessing neighboring registers, which could have the potential of triggering memory access outside the R6 contest, and and therefore just enabling a full GPU takeover. I did that in 2016 with some proof of concept, which from which you could attempt to escalate to hypervisor privileges, but yeah. It's, it's quite an interesting architecture for, for the user land facing drivers. Um, in any case, during this talk, we will focus on the user land facing side of PGRAPH and the P5.0 engines. So let's start with PGRAPH. And let's start from the fundamentals, the graphics pipeline. 
Uh, in a nutshell, this is a multi-stage conveyor belt that turns input vertices, textures, and other attributes into pixels inside the buffer. So what are these stages? Uh, in the Direct3D9 API, uh, they consist of two programmable stages or shaders, vertex shaders and pixel shaders, named after the type of data they process, and few non-programmable stages in between. A combine can draw, for instance, a primitive triangle by having its vertices gathered by the input assembler, each processed by a vertex shader, typically for camera-related linear transforms, then turned into pixels by the rasterizer, which are then colored by the pixel shader, and finally blended or just written back into the render target by the output merger. Um, of course, optionally with texture sampled at each shader. And just to be clear, Direct3D is just an example. Um, same overall model applies to OpenGL, ES, WebGL, and, and, and many other APIs uh, back then. So all of these high-level APIs are simply an abstraction on top of the capabilities of different GPUs. They offer an API to configure uh, fixed stages and a shading language to configure programmable stages. And that's it. Implementation details, such as where the input data physically resides or how shaders are programmed, are undefined, and they should. After all, it's up to the graphics driver to specify how the hardware will conform with the specifications and either exclude or emulate unsupported features. In the RSX and the user land library that abstracts it, called GCM, the location uh, of data is clearly defined, uh, with resources being explicitly allocated in RAM and or VRAM as allowed or needed. The pipeline comprises similar though finer grained stages with some name changes. For instance, we talk about fragment programs instead of pixel shaders, but, but it's the same thing really. Uh, the configuration of fixed stages and dispatching of draw calls at the GCM API um, seamlessly translates into P5 co uh, commands at near zero overhead. And this in turn translates to MMI or Gisser writes in PGraph. And regarding shaders, uh, although the NVIDIA CG shading language was provided to the developers, uh, vertex and fragment programs are supplied as pre-compiled bytecode blobs, which are bundled directly into applications and games. So, uh, of course, we are trying really hard to fit the RSX model into a known API. The actual PGraph graphics pipeline consists of four major stages called blocks which are executed sequentially on draw calls to first gather and process geometry, second rasterize primitives, then color the resulting fragments, and lastly update the color and depth buffers in the ROPs, um, informing the raster block to discard occluded fragments as some sort of optimization. This is a non-unified shader architecture, where vertex programs are executed in a unit called VBE, and fragment programs across the SCT and B units, featuring slightly different architectures and capabilities. Next, we will go in depth into the stages with special focus on the programmable ones. Um, starting with the geometry block, vertices textures are gathered by the IDX, dispatched through the F uh, VPEs via the VAB, and then cooled with the VPC <laughs> um, uh, just to be sent into the next stage. Um, the most interesting part, the vertex processing engines. They define explicitly input and output registers with hard-coded meanings to map nicely into the Direct3D, OpenGL, and Vulkan counterparts. In addition to 32 temporary registers and 468 constant registers, which hold data that you would define in like Direct3D globals or OpenGL uniforms. Uh, sorry, uh, HLSL globals and GLSL uniforms. Um, all of these are 128-bit four-component registers, which contrast with the long vectors in modern architectures. Then there is support for texture sampling with both static and dynamic branching by condition registers and Boolean constants. Instructions are similarly 128 bits and encode quite complex behavior with built-in swizzling and masking, conditional writing and other simple operations on destination register such as like absolute and negative uh, values. Uh, then the rasterizer blocks, which uh, turns resulting vectors into fragments based on the chosen primitive, interpolating its attributes through a series of steps, which we are going to skip, <laughs> and optionally discarding those who fail depth or stencil tests. What matters to us is that everything here conforms with what you would otherwise find in OpenGL and Direct3D. Uh, none of the subunits have 
observable effects that diverge from what you would be able to represent using high-level PC APIs. Then the fragment and texture block, which is made of a fragment distributor to six pipelines, each with an instruction processor that dispatches to two units. Shade their computation top and bottom in a potentially simultaneous way, similar to the SPUs. However, here, dependency conflicts may have observable effects. And that's the reason why explicit fences are introduced, which are quite horrible in my opinion. Register space is heavily modified compared to the VPE, with outputs aliased on data registers. Again, these are a total of 48 single precision, four component, 128 bit vector registers, and uh, with pairs of half precision registers overlapped in them. The texture samplers increase to 16, and the constant registers are removed in favor of inline constants in instructions. These instructions are again 128 bit, but with a strange mixed Indian encoding where like half words are swapped, similar to PDP 11. Uh, they reside in VRAM and have suffix and opcode additions on top of what VPE supports. And lastly, the raster operation block, uh, where all collected fragments are used to update the Z cool RAM and VRAM Z buffers, then using the color information to update up to four MRTs. And that's a graphics pipeline. Uh, we have glossed over texture attributes, vertex formats, and other details as they mostly trivially map to common graphics APIs. There's a few exceptions, such as the Swizzle texture scanning, which are fixed in emulators by, by pre or post processing data and software. But yeah, that's it. Uh, this concludes PGraph. Uh, but how is this engine configured and launch? Uh, the answer is PFIFO. As mentioned earlier, this is the command submission engine, which gets mapped as is into userland by LV2 to let GCM submit commands, which either P5O executes or forwards to other engines. These commands are somewhat similar to the AMD PM4 packets, in which they specify one or many 32-bit value writes at incrementing or fixed 16-bit offsets. Similarly, they allow jumping and reusing command buffers by calling to and returning from them. Jump to self commands are sometimes used to pause the command processor until cell patches that command away. Um, these offsets or methods are mapped to different engines, such as the P5 for itself, PGraph 2D or 3D objects, and others responsible for blitting or copying memory around or delivering interrupts. These mappings are controlled by the driver, but the internals of NVIDIA objects and, and context creation will be left out of scope for this talk. As far as userland emulators are concerned, only when context is considered, and all mappings objects are fixed, which results in emulators hard coding much of the otherwise dynamic behavior. And that's about hardware. Uh, there's other peripherals connected to the South Bridge, which are fairly standard, so we'll leave them out and jump straight into software. Uh, in this section, we will see how the cell operating system utilizes the hardware described previously. So first of all, the PlayStation 3 represents quite a change from the software stack in the PS1 and 2. It moved from a so-called BIOS or shell to a full-fledged operating system, which is two orders of magnitudes larger in size. Uh, they named it Cell OS, and it is quite inspired by the PSP OS, both in internals and looks. Uh, the system is spread across all three PowerPC privilege modes, compressed of uh, LV1 or Level 1 as hypervisor, Level 2 as kernel, and user land which some people unofficially nickname Muscle Level 3, which I quite like a lot. Um, there's the fail overflows uh, console hacking talk at 27C3, which is an excellent in-depth overview of the system and its fails. Um, but our overview will be comparatively shorter, as our initial goal as simulator developers is just understanding what runs where and which component pulls to which component, so be it software and hardware. Um, so in a nutshell, who knows who, right? Um, so let's begin with the insanely complex bootloader. So before firmware 3.60, the boot process involved the following stages. First in order, the syscon chip is powered on, which runs its internal ROM. Syscon initializes cell by submitting a so-called configuration ring and disables the 8th SPU, as mentioned earlier. Then the PPU boots from a hidden ROM whose purpose is loading a so-called bootloader into the first SPU. The bootloader initializes both memory and I.O. and then loads LV0 for the PPU. LV0 loads the meta loader into the third SPU, which sequentially loads um, first the LV1 loader for the hypervisor, the LV2 loader for the supervisor or kernel, the app loader that loads user line applications such as VSH, and the ISO loader that loads modules in the third SPU, uh, which remains from this moment on reserved as an isolated SPU.
And by the way, when I say load, I mean both verification and decryption. This process is basically the chain of trust. Following GeoHot's metal loader exploit, Sony changed the boot process, removing the metal loader and relocating all the subloaders to LV0. With everything now in place, we can discuss cell OS. Uh, let's start with the hypervisor, and why in hell are there all three PowerPC layers used in the system? This likely stems from the other OS feature, as a means to isolate non-cell hardware resources irrelevant to supercomputing, but that could, maybe in Sony's view, hurt their business interests. Again, this is just speculation. But it makes sense, uh, as otherwise LV1 is pretty much useless. Whatever the reason, LV1 persists until these days, even after the removal of otherwise support. Expanding a bit on PowerPC, there are three privilege levels based on some MSRs, hypervisor mode, supervisor mode, and user mode, or problem state. The cell documentation refers to the first two as privilege 1 and 2, respectively. Address translation in PowerPC involves two steps, which you can see on the right, a linear search on SLB and a hash table lookup on HTAP. In cell OS, LV2 handles SLB and LV1 handles HTAP, and also SLB on the SPUs, which are designed the same way. You'll notice that similar to the to x86, the minimum page size is 4 kilobyte, but the effective to real translation process is quite different from the x86 virtual to physical one. As you can imagine, this process would be quite expensive for full system emulation. LV1 accomplishes this and other tasks by offering around 150 hyper calls to the LV2 and other OS. So Linux sources are quite helpful to understand the LV1 interface. As you can see on the left, some hardware calls are rather simple and low level, such as PCI device access, um, which is typically for Southbridge devices, but anything deemed sensitive by Sony, such as storage or R6, are managed directly by the hypervisor. Also regarding this, Picard and me reversed uh, part of the RSX and IOIF drivers, so this plus the PSDF wiki reference may be helpful to anyone seeking to emulate cell OS at lower levels. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, think of LV1 as merely a hardware resource allocator. Beyond this, it serves no security purpose, and we can move on to LV2. LV2 is a custom monolithic kernel written by Sony, with cherry-picked pieces from NetBSD and FreeBSD, allegedly for things like file system, network stack, and so on, but I've never checked myself, so no idea. Uh, most interfaces exposed to userland are centered around kernel objects. These are instances of really anything userland requires, things like timers, synchronization primitives, file descriptors, and abstractions on top of devices. Their lifecycle is pretty much OOP-like, with constructors, methods, and destructors, all called via syscalls. And each instance is uniquely identified through a 32-bit integer, just like FDs. These syscalls return 32-bit error codes, which look somewhat inspired by Erno, but it looks like they gave up halfway through. Um, anyway, based on this design, many device drivers have dedicated syscalls operating on objects rather than running IOCTLs on file descriptors. And as you can imagine, there is user and hardware ID checks guarding some of them. So compared to LV1, the LV2 interface grows fivefold in size. And just to give a quick overview, it provides higher level functionality, such as process, threat, and memory management, POSIX file system, and sockets. Uh, memory management, debugging, synchronization primitives, and the driver interfaces we just mentioned. And that's all regarding the LV2 kernel. To be honest, nothing here is particularly interesting or complex. Re-implementing LV2 on high-level emulators is mostly a matter of patience and muscle. So let's jump directly to user land. These are basically processes running in PowerPC's problem state with 32-bit EAs instead of the kernel 64-bit ones, and might allocate resources or execute code on SPUs and R6 contexts, as we just saw. After initialization, LV2 will load vsh.elf, from which the iconic XMB menu is displayed. This allows users to configure the system, install and launch games, um, but vsh reserves one of the R6 contexts, from which it overlays a menu when pressing the home button. Um, but yeah, it's quite a complex piece of software, with plenty of imports and exports involved, um, more than focusing on internals of specific processes, we'll focus on a few common areas. So first, regarding modules, all executables and their dynamic libraries use an ELF-based format, namely uh, named self and uh, SPRX, respectively, but largely identical. They contain few extra headers with uh, metadata about versioning and to encrypt and verify signatures, which is a must on retail consoles followed by a standard ELF stream uh, with custom segments and flags to handle relocations, import-exports, mapping uh, to SPU MMUs and R6 guards, 
and other Sony or PS3 specific things. User applications might access a subset of the following mount points in a virtual file system to access removable storage devices, hard drive partitions, and the internal flash, as well as so-called dummy file systems mapped to the application's user there and on dev kits accessing directly the remote development computer. Besides that, user applications can load dynamic libraries from Flash, aka cell system modules, which provide fancy stable interfaces to the LV2 kernel, system configuration and utilities, uh, potentially managed by VSH, codecs for a dozen formats and some are even SPU accelerated, um, networking, PSN utilities, and just too many things, it's a lot of code. Um, games may also ship their own ASPRX files, sometimes wrapped in other custom container formats, such as SData used, for instance, to ship SPU programs. Then, of course, there is code that static libraries from SDKs embed directly in executables. And even though we don't have access to them, we can infer their existence from symbols and different commercial games. But it's mostly things like GSEMs, helpers, and libc. Um, can be hooked and emulated if you want, but it's a bit overkill. And that's all regarding user land uh, and cell OS in general. Of course, we omitted gigantic chunks of the system, uh, which include the PSP, PlayStation 1, and 2 emulators, uh, but those are just distractions from our final goal, which is creating a PS3 emulator. In this section, we will discuss different design strategies to make a PS3 emulator, glance over the many attempts of the past decade, and conclude with a walkthrough of RPCS3 to understand what and how it handles part of the hardware and software we just saw. But before getting there, let's answer the question. Which approach do we want to follow? A low-level, full-system emulation approach or a high-level one? In other words, um, which of the many parts of the PS3 should an emulator re-implement? I think as emulator developers, asking ourselves what we want to preserve is a good idea. I mean, emulation without purpose is just a one-way ticket to a metal asylum. Um, the requirements to preserve other OS distros are very different from just preserving games. Um, once you have a goal, say games for instance, follow the flowchart below and figure the extra trade-offs between executing something and re-implementing it. Executing things is tempting, but it simply shifts the problem towards its dependencies, while typically increasing performance overhead. Consciously or not, all emulator developers go through this thought process, and for the PS3 it always resulted in userland emulators which re-implemented either syscalls or libraries. Uh, sure, not for IBM, but different needs, different approach. And I mean, look at this dependency hell, how deep you want to go is entirely up to you. If you only care about game A, you might as well reverse and re-implement it and forget about the PS3. Or if you care about few games from a studio, just re-implement the game engine, uh, run PPU code maybe, and forget about RSX and GCM. Uh, but neither would be a PS3 emulator, would it? And I mean, it's not totally crazy, back then it happened a lot, uh, see the Scum VM and Mario 64 decompilation projects. Um, but yeah, covering most PS3 titles involves at least implementing everything they can directly talk to, which is quite a lot. And once you realize it's too much, like in RPCS3, you might implement LV2 syscalls instead, but that will require your users to extract SPRX themselves. Or if you keep going down the rabbit hole, what about implementing and running LV2? And that will give you other OS. Or what if you want to easily fast and debug LV1? Or maybe run Syscon firmware. Uh, let's not get started with firmware and other coprocessor. Um, as you see, like high level and low level can be quite relative terms. Full system emulation is all about implementing every observable hardware behavior that software could notice. And if you're still unconvinced this is crazy on the PS3, think of the massive hardware and software stack we went through. And that was just a tiny fraction of the whole picture. It is impractical for developers, uh, userland facing interfaces are simply much better documented and can be easily mapped to hosts. Best case scenario is trivial, just like, you know, POSIX to POSIX mapping, much better than dealing with hardware I.O. Even end users would suffer as a result of performance overhead and requiring to dump and decrypt the various ROMs needed along the way. Nonetheless, some subsets of PS3 hardware have been fully emulated. Uh, like uh, IBM's system sim derived from a PowerPC full system emulator named Mambo. It simulates everything we saw earlier, down to caches and buses, but uh, even if it's an interesting project, uh, it's closed uh, source and impractical for game preservation at a reasonable performance. So let's focus on the other approach, user mode emulation. This considers the entire execution surface, in our case PPE userland, SPUs and RSX commands and shaders, 
and implement all direct dependencies, in our case, LV2, MFC, and PGraph context, respectively, among other things, of course. Um, we did that, but some concerns and myths appeared in the early days. Um, some worried that high-level emulators were inaccurate, um, but inaccuracies can always be fixed. They are not an intrinsic property of the approach. Um, it's just that they are a little bit more subtle and they take a longer time to fix. Just compare a broken kerning in font rendering versus a disastrous ALU mistranslation. Um, others also worried about cell translation overhead when extrapolating figures from other PlayStation and PowerPC emulators. However, this underestimated all sources of overhead that just go away with user mode emulation. And of course, optimizations brought by optimizing IRs and high-level emulation. Um, so what you see on the right is simply what userland PS3 emulators need to care about, um, including cryptography, which I intentionally uh, neglected, neglected so far. So for the past decade, all known emulators have followed this approach. Um, as you see, RPC S3 is leading in terms of completeness and, well, not being abandoned. Uh, but along the way, we have seen many other attempts, and even if comparatively they are incomplete by design or chance, they deserve at least a mention. Um, besides RPC S3, both shortwaves and nucleus managed to run graphical samples, so we'll cover them briefly now. And, and maybe PS3F too, but it's hard to check. Shortwaves was a closed source emulator by Russian developer Inori Rus. Uh, it supported full PPU and SPU translation by interpreters and was experimenting with a JIT recompiler that surprisingly outputs C. Um, graphic simulation was fairly complete and written in Direct3D9, uh, which is great for simplicity and compatibility at the time, and re implements all system libraries. Um, in the other hand, Nucleus was a project started by myself to experiment with somewhat lower level R6 and LB2 emulation. It introduced a custom IR for the PPU and SPU JIT recompilers and a custom graphics API. Um, it was a little bit overkill in hindsight, but I learned a lot. And it also executed system libraries rather than re-implementing them. Just wanted to say the shortwave C++ based translator was fascinating. Uh, the PowerPC nerds among you might recognize the MFSPR instruction at the very left. It basically turns every basic block of instructions into C++, helped by some common headers, and then it gets compiled into a DLL and linked into the emulator. It's quite smart, uh, and I mean, I get that emitting sources is fairly standard for shattered translators, but seeing this on a CPU JIT recompiler is totally unconventional. As for my project Nucleus, uh, it had a multi-host and multi-guest design with a custom optimizing IR for CPU translation following some LLVM experiments, also a graphics API and shading language based on Spear-V, and plenty of C++ syntactic sugar to easily define user interface, widget, and scene in a manner that is somewhat familiar for web developers. Uh, but yeah, as I said earlier, frankly it was over-engineered and we'll cover only uh, one fun aspect of the CPU translation process. And so if you're familiar with an IR with IR based JIT recompilers, especially LLVM, you will easily recognize the code below, in which we just implement the PowerPC NAND instruction by reading source registers, we do the thing, and we write them back. Um, all this happens through opaque LLVM value pointers, which are checked for correctness only at guest compile time, which is when the emulator is running already. Um, in Nucleus, I moved towards a custom type-checked IR builder where values are templated over guest types. This allows to catch type mismatch errors when building the emulator, which is much better than having just crashes at runtime. And of course, by using the auto keyword from C++, these checks can happen completely seamlessly, uh, regardless of which IR builder flavor you use. And under the hood, it is quite simple. Uh, the templated value class is simply a wrapper around the LLVM value pointers um, with explicit cast to pass things around. Um, the first template argument indicates the guest primitive integer or floating point type, while the second one is just the number of components. So it's defaulted to one, uh, which is used to deal with scalars. And yeah, uh, in turn, all type-checked IR builder methods check for correctness via constraints on the templated method declaration, or just by adding explicit static asserts. And if compile time checks are passed, then it will be forwarded to the underlying LLVM IR builder. And even better, at zero runtime overhead. And now let's finally focus on RPCS3. 
This project was started by DH and Hikem, two PS2 and PSP emu devs and hackers respectively, along with the invaluable support of Black Demon and other Russian contributors who gave RPCS3 its your hilarious original name. Um, its initial commit dates back to 2011, when it was merely a PS3 elf assembler and disassembler, using WF widgets and C++. During the earlier years, it evolved as a proof-of-concept capable of running just simple fake sign homebrew apps, all done with just a PPU interpreter, a barely functioning SPU interpreter, and basic HLE of the most simple threading, file system, and graphics functionality, along an uh, OpenGL based R6 emulation. So, and so the original disassembler was slowly evolving into a debugger. At this time, RPCS3 supported both 32 bit and 64 bit hosts, but remember that the guest virtual address space, I mean, that is the, the effective address space, is 32 bit. Uh, with fixed 256 megabyte segments. Um, as a result, some games and libraries had the bad habit of hard coding base addresses in memory, especially RSX and SPU ones. So how could the emulator translate these excesses? Um, the solution was to do a linear search on a fixed array of memory mapped into the host virtual address space. Hard coded blocks uh, were pre-allocated and the heap would be allocated on demand as needed. Uh, this allowed to fit everything in 32-bit hosts. However, soon 32-bit host support was removed, which simplified everything a lot, um, allowing 64-bit hosts to simply reserve for gigabyte chunks for the effective address space which must better. In fact, RPCS3 does so multiple times, remapping with different permissions. And now, translating a memory address uh, is just a matter of adding a base offset. The underlying memory is allocated on demand, except for the you know, typically hard-coded segments, such as VRAM. On top of this, RPCS3 does a lot of synthetic sugar for HLE functions performing memory accesses. One example is the implicit NDN conversion that allows re-implemented syscalls and modules to seamlessly operate in big NDN values, as you see below. Uh, this is accomplished through a swapped Endian helper class that implicitly converts from and to um, native primitive types by introducing a templated swap operation that just reverses size of t bytes. Um, and of course, all operators are overloaded to avoid, um, to avoid breaking the illusion. And similarly, RPCS3 uh, also does the implicit memory translation through a pointer wrapper, which allows seamlessly accessing structures via 32-bit pointers by adding just the 64-bit host base address that we talked about earlier. And even better, it is aware of big Endian conventions, so you don't have to do that explicitly either. You, ju you can simply use it and be confident that it will conform to the ABI and the PS3. And like before, it also overloads uh, operators to perform pointer arithmetic. Uh, such features are incredibly important, and they allow developers to focus on the code without distractions. I've shot my own feet countless times with QMU by forgetting to explicitly swap NDNS. And fortunately, RPCS3 had all of this as early as 2013. Over the next years, RPCS3 evolved all cell-related binary translators, arguably the most fundamental part of PS3 emulators, improving interpreter quality and performance, and introducing new recompilers. These improvements during 2013 and 14 led to the first playable commercial games. Most efforts when creating a binary translator go to reading ISA specs and implementing instructions, then working on testing, fixing and optimizing them. But the complexity of this cannot be measured by silly metrics such as number of opcodes or let alone number of transistors, um, but rather by the properties of entire groups or types of instructions that you see mentioned here. Next we'll quickly glance over the RPCS3 PPU and SPU translators, providing few examples and edge cases. Just one ALU and one branching instruction example is enough, like, you know, seen one, seen them all. Um, more ALU-related opcodes usually does not imply more hardships for emidevs, but for instance, wider uh, ALU SIMD components could. SIMD, sorry. Um, so in RPCS3, the PPU interpreter was the earliest component, and it was a textbook fetch code execute loop done in software, keeping the third state in memory. So the instruction decoder was quite over-engineered, dropping every instruction handler with a common binder object in heap which extracts instruction fields and then forwards them as arguments to virtual methods. Uh, it was just needless overhead and complexity yeah, with dynamic polymorphism, which was quite common in RPCS3 back then. 
Uh, four years later, Nekotekina switched to a more sane and simpler static polymorphism approach where instruction tables in a base decoder class point to the handlers of the derived class via CRTP. This allows to reuse the decoder for both disassembler interpreter and other translators at zero overhead. Additionally, he rewrote Altivec instruction handlers with x86 CMD intrinsics, which were simpler and helped the compiler at generating better code, because sometimes it generated nearly 20 times as much as needed uh, when auto-victorization screws up. This translator persists until this day, mostly for debugging and fallback purposes. Around the same time, well, actually one year earlier, uh, Gopal created uh, LLVM-based G-translator of basic blocks. In a nutshell, every branch triggered a lookup of catch translations, and on misses, it will translate the whole block until a branch was found. Like the interpreter, it relied on x86 intrinsics, and register reads and writes were turned into LLVM loads and stores into the corresponding PPU thread object. And besides few DCE-like optimization, there was no proper memory to register promotion passes. So yeah, um, it was a simple design for a recompiler, uh, but it still managed to provide an impressive order of magnitude of speed up over naive interpreter in some titles. Uh, and two years later, Nigori wrote the recompiler to its current state. And while doing so, he switched to a head-of-time approach, where entire modules were translated. Uh, this is where LVM excels, and it is possible because all executable pages are known ahead of time due to security constraints. So each newly loaded PRX library will be recompiled and cached. Even better, when installing the PS3 firmware, besides unpacking the root file system, RPCS3 will pre-compile every binary within. That way, uh, with a few minutes of pre-processing, you get instant full-speed execution without lags. Uh, Nickel also removed x86 intrinsics of fa uh, in favor of backend agnostic features, and in doing so, he moved to a type checker IR builder like um, Nucleus, even with nicer semantics for vectors. Um, besides that, the PPU thread state, decoders, and all ALU translation remain the same, besides many fixes over the years. The SPU emulation underwent a similar evolution, starting with an interpreter in 2012 by DH the NECO's ASM JIT block recompiler, which was a direct translation to x86 without an IR, like many other older emulators. Um, it had low latency, predictable performance, register allocation for, for temporaries, um, but no optimization passes to fully utilize the host hardware. This changed in 2018 with NECO's uh, LLVM recompiler. Uh, we won't cover translation internals because it's, again, the same thing as PPU. Uh, except that it doesn't do AOT uh, ahead of time module translation because it's a little bit trickier. So it targets functions uh, after pre-analyzing them and computing their CFG. Um, as for SPU channels, they are just fixed IO with their number hardcoded in the instruction field. For some, we call a native uh, function like most emulators. However, to reduce context switches, some inline LLVM IR. This happens particularly in memory-like and status-like channels where you can load and store the value. And when atomicity is required, then atomic RMW OPS are emitted. So channels data is held in either primitive types or helpless structures called like SPU channel and SPU channel 4 for mailboxes, which are just wrappers around RPCS3 custom atomic types. Uh, and adding just few push and pop methods that mostly the interpreter relies on. Regarding the MFC, as we said, it is configured to have the same effective address space, so uh, no, there's no need for software MMU and transfers. MFC command writes will initiate DMA transfers, which get inline in the basic block for performance, as you see in the pseudocode example below. Um, so among the few SPU oddities, let's check the weird float32 behavior we saw earlier, also called xfloat. This is basically smax clamping and setting the normal to zero. Of course, we could apply set clamps and set the norms to zero, but I mean, that's in fact done in as a fast approximation, but there's edge cases to the edge case where the translated code will still generate NANDs or ENFs when we run out of exponent bits. So host machines can hardly help us. Uh, so in accurate mode, we manually cast to double precision to avoid overflows, do the operation, uh, which will happen on YMM registers if we're lucky, and then cast back, manually clamping and rounding as needed. This takes a toll on performance, so that's why the fast mode is there, um, with tailored approximations where needed. You can see a comparison on the right 
Up next is GPU emulation. The code is organized in a common frontend that manages the guest GPU state and sub-engines, and the backends for specific graphics APIs, whose drivers will manage to translate it to our host GPU. Of these, Vulkan is the most notable one, written within weeks of its release in 2016 by KD11. It is responsible for translating the RSX context to a Vulkan pipeline, creating command queues with draw calls and fetching reports, as requested by Pifaco, as well as optimizing some tasks in compute shaders. For shader translation, we generate JLSL, which turns into SpearV, which turns into whatever your host GPU wants over a long process. Um, well, just some milliseconds, but that is enough to cast stutters. Fortunately, games don't care if we draw, so we compile shaders asynchronously and draw when they are ready. As you see on the right, this is a kind of pick your poison dilemma. Either get stutters or get missing geometry. So in another genius move, KD11 added shader interpreters in 2020. This puts the RSX bytecode and fetch the code execute loop entirely in your host GPU. And I mean, people are ready to run Linux on pixel shaders, so why the hell not? Anyway, let's check shader translation, uh, the vertex one, because it's simpler. It consists of a main loop that fetches a VP instruction and turns the opcode into an equivalent GLSL expression, as you see on the right. Uh, some translations are trivial, but others require emulation to work, and tricky opcodes even need hardware tests to understand how they work. Uh, both inputs and outputs of these GLSL expressions are constructed as on the left. There is instruction flags that trigger some pre- and post-processing of values. Temporaries are declared on demand as VEC4s. Addresses are IVEC4s and scalars are splat, so also VEC4. Uh, funny here are conditional ops, which are emulated by mix interpolation. Also branching is emulated using go to statements. Um, you think it's not allowed in GLSL? Check this out. We can track executed addresses and create an infinite loop where every basic block corresponds to an if statement that checks the current address. This way, we can simulate go-tos, and once the last instruction is reached, we break out and return. And what is even better, drivers will recognize these patterns and turn it back into something sane. And same with fragment programs. Operands map to JLSL expressions where sources and destinations are modified by instruction flags. Uh, texture samples and fetches are mapped to standard things. Kill to discard if that doesn't destroy drivers. Um, the help registers are trivial to translate on float 16 capable hosts, otherwise emulated on single positions by clamping outputs. Pack and unpack operations, which also translate nicely. And yeah, most work by KD11 here was determining whether opcodes comply with standard behavior or do something unusual. Because for every observable behavior, even edge cases like the diff square root, a game relies on it. And please note, this is just an overview of RPC S3 and so simplified, it almost looks easy. I strip many cool internals and features, especially in GPU emulation. If you check the sources, you'll realize it's actually harder. I kind of wish for KD11 to do our RSX-only talk with full internals on shader recompilation, precise z emulation, and benchmarks for different features. But until then, fingers crossed, I guess. And lastly, there is high-level emulation by hooking system and library calls. The former is trivial since it's a dedicated instruction, but the latter... Well, earlier versions used to patch import accesses with a custom hack instruction, but these days the ASPRX is loaded as usual and the destination function is hooked instead. Interpreter hooks are kind of trivial, but on recompilers they require extra work. In RPC S3, a PPU function manager keeps track of a function and emits branches to so-called trampolines to switch between guest and host contexts. But the internals of this are quite convoluted and sadly we have to skip them. So about advantages, the most obvious one is performance. Uh, video with FFmpeg will always beat translators, and we do. Um, also, once you get enough lip calls done, you will need to firmware for most apps, uh, although that's still work in progress. And one underrated advantage, sometimes hacky HLE fixes allow other devs to work in areas blocked by emulator bugs. So there's that. Sure, it comes at a development cost, but sometimes it pays off. Another cool feature is implicitly dealing with ABI-defined argument and return values. In PowerPC, arguments get allocated in strange ways sometimes, but C++ templates allows us to parse host function signatures and map their inputs and outputs to the guest PPU registers, all at compile time. Again, this allows us to reduce boilerplate code, keeping our focus on the actions, not the location of the data. And it is extremely powerful when combined with the NDN and guest pointer helpers we saw earlier. At the right, you can see an overly simplified version of this, but yeah, it's just variadic templates using type traits to map host to guest types, casting to and from the right register and with indices being tracked and passed via template arguments. RPC S3 actually uses track templates finite, but 
whatever. Here I use consexper, which I think it's nicer to read. Before closing, I wanted to cover briefly testing and debugging. Emulator tests come in two flavors. Some are like unit tests running purely in the host machine. They require plenty of preparation, but are quite reliable. While others are more like integration tests, entire Humbrews that fast features in consoles printing out results, and they serve as a reference to emulators. They are easy to make and not tied to any specific emulators, but they are just more brittle. You can see the examples of both below. While working on RPCS3 and Nucleus, I wrote some tests for PPU and SPU code, RSX primitives, textures and fragment shaders, and some LV2 syscalls. As I said, these were executed on a real PlayStation 3 console to produce the output images and values that you see on the right. These were provided as ground truth to the emulators. This approach was quite cost-effective, and you can see more examples of that in the PS3 Autotest repo. Both emulators also support guest CPU and GPU debugging, providing bytecode disassemblers, control over some execution units, memory and register access, and HLE kernel introspection. This is always really helpful to understand the root cause of bugs and regressions, and the only difference between both emus was the interface design. RPC wrote everything as part of their cute user interface, which was formerly WX widgets, but in Nucleus, I went for another fancy yet over-engineered approach, where the emulator exposed a debugging server with a custom API nicknamed Nerf and a web frontend that connects to it. And of course, using proper host debugging tools, especially for graphics with render drug and insight, has been of great help over the years, are making, well, any kind of GPU accelerated emulators, really. And this brings us to the end of our tour through the real and emulated PlayStation 3 consoles. Of course, there are some pending features, some of which are mentioned in the RPCS3 longer term roadmap. One that many people request is having full PSN-like uh, online functionality. Things like messaging, achievement, sharing things with friends and online gaming. Um, support for USB peripherals, such as microphones, cameras, other gamepads. Emulation without firmware via full HLE. That is, re-implementing every library and resource that you would otherwise find in a pub file. Support for ARM V8 hosts, which in the advent of ARM for desktops and laptops is becoming increasingly more important. And lastly, something that every emulator developer or exploit developer can agree on is improving debuggers and tests. Um, that's on the menu and that's quite exciting if you ask me. I also have some closing thoughts and wishes. I don't know who the audience will be and who is going to end up watching this video, but one thing for aspiring emulator developers is aim for the end game. Um, this is not said enough, in my opinion, but if you want to emulate platform X, just forget about the NES. Just go for X. Both will be hard, and don't get me wrong, one will be simpler than the other, but both will be frustrating, and you need every ounce of motivation you can possibly get. It's been my experience that you can only get that from platforms you deeply care about. Um, also, don't be afraid of starting your own emulator, even if there is one already for that console. I think cross-pollination grows developers and scenes. Uh, there is this misnotion that there is a rivalry between different emulators of the same platform, but that's simply not the case. In free and open source software, alternatives are not really competitors. They are a source of inspiration and ideas. Also, if you do start your own emulator, don't be afraid of stopping it either. <laughs> this is quite controversial, but I think there is some escalation of commitment going on sometimes. People start projects out of personal interest and growth, and things evolve into something too big to fail or too big to stop. Um, if you think your time is better spent elsewhere, just do it. And, and one thing that I think also everybody could agree on is reading emulator sources is important. Follow commits as if they were the news. Um, tastes develop when exposed to variety. And there is hidden gems and hidden tricks and ideas behind every emulator. Uh, I don't remember which ones, but Nucleus contains traces of so many of them. It contains like a binary translator, which was quite inspired by Xenia, the Xbox 360 emulator, also XQMU and many others. Uh, I, ca I cannot remember the names, but it is the one best single thing to do, in my opinion. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And special thanks to everybody here mentioned on the right. Um, these are people without which this presentation as such would not be possible. Uh, there is people who I might have forgotten, 
people who remain anonymous, but all of them have collectively managed to make this happen. So thanks to them. Um, and well, now it's time for questions. I'm not sure how this is going to be handled since this is pre-recorded, but I guess comments is good as any way to do this. Thank you.